Hi, this is your host, Sapna Bhartia, and welcome to TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again, Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of Rack. And Rob, it's great to have you on the show. Swap, it's a pleasure to be here. So today we are going to talk about uh, last week when the whole world came to a standstill. A lot of folks, uh, friends of mine, they were traveling and suddenly they were stuck at airport and, you know, windows, you know, risk of death. Everybody was blaming Microsoft for it. But what really happened? Who is to be blamed here? But before we play the blame game, please tell me what happened. We're still waiting on postmortems, but uh, it's pretty clear that what what happened was that CrowdStrike made a um, emergency update to their profiles. So they they are a system that does scanning for malicious code, intrusion attacks, and things like that, which requires very deep access to the systems involved. They made an update to their profiles and systems, and that profile had a glitch of some sort that caused Windows, because they needed that deep cra- that, that deep access to crash. And uh, once Windows had crashed in that, it required manual intervention for the systems. Uh, so, uh, and then of course, resetting Windows in a way that eliminated whatever the profiles that uh, you put in. So that means, booting into safe mode, getting the system to boot in a way that you can then apply the patches to put put or revert the profile and then resume operations. So um, basically, you know, it's it's a software patch is the simple answer. Uh, and then, but a software patch of such that you couldn't just remediate using the standardized processes to make things go. You had to touch the systems by hand. Um, and that created a tremendous disruption uh, across the industry. Would you put it in under the software failure error or human error? Anything like this, there's elements of all those components. It's really a system issue, a system error. Um, so when something like this happens, you know, it's definitely there's a person behind it and there's probably systems that rush to patch through uh, a QA, the QA process more quickly than it needed. Um, but there's layers of problems that go in behind this. One is the amount of automation and checks that have to go in, um, being able to push a rollout to a global scale all at once. Um, and then for the systems that are in the field, the lack of automation and recovery that force them to be hand-touched um, is also a component. So um, in IT infrastructure that we play in, which is all data centers, there's out-of-band management, so you have a backup way to control things. Um, and that often allows you to do a type of recovery if the primary systems don't work, like a Windows patch doesn't work. Uh, for a lot of cases, most people's desktops, they're back to touching it by hand because it's the desktop you're used to touching it by hand. Uh, data center servers always have a backup system because people don't usually spend any time in data centers. They don't want to. And so um, in this case, we, we ended up with a lot of places that required human intervention because they didn't have the out-of-band management and control systems that you might find if you were talking about a data center system. Uh, and data center systems were definitely also impacted. Uh, it's always a challenge to, to fix something where the, the, you've actually broken the original OS, the, the core system. So getting into safe mode requires specialized processes uh, then patching it requires specialized processes. Definitely a very significant amount of work if you haven't drilled and rehearsed that type of automation. As you said, you know, a lot of postmortem had to be done. We don't have much information, but what kind of, I wonder, processes CrowdStrike has in place before they send these kind of patches, changes out to millions of that to business critical uh, devices? I am absolutely certain that they have a lengthy QA process where they have automated tests and they run things through automated systems. Um, and they, I suspect, also have what would be called an A-B test or a stage deployment system in which uh, changes go through to a small group, a larger group, and then a, a bigger and bigger group before they go out to this type of global rollout. And that type of process catches issues like this with a much smaller blast radius. So the fact that they distribute a patch this quickly to such a, a large audience um, indicates that it, they felt either incorrectly or, um, and they haven't given any indication that there was some threat or profile that they felt was necessary to push this type of patch that quickly. Uh, and I want to be very clear here. These are, are normal, right? It's, it's not normal to have a global disruption, but 
it is very important and normal to be able to quickly distribute patches to a wide audience, right? The fact that CrowdStrike can do this is important to creating uh, actually well-defended and resilient systems. The, the challenge here is that we we had a patch go through that had a, you know, just didn't go through the vetting process that it, it should have gone through before it went out. Um, and, you know, CrowdStrike is a professional company to do this all the time. They put out patches all the time. Um, this is a, a lapse and the postmortem is going to, you know, find out what caused them to skip steps that they would have normally gone through. When we look at the teams within organizations, which team was sweating the most? Uh, this is definitely an operations team challenge. And and operations was one of those funny things. When you do operations right, nobody notices. It's supposed to be invisible. When there's an, a problem in infrastructure, and this isn't just IT infrastructure, it's you know your electricity, it's your plumbing, your water, your roads. Uh, I live in Baltimore, and, and we just had a major infrastructure failure that everybody's been noticing. Um, and um, you know, in the road, road and bridge system, you know, this this is these things happen. It's very easy to have a high entropy event like this, and then that tests your resilience planning. And I, I think the real issue here is not whether CrowdStrike introduced a bad patch. That will happen. The operations challenge on the other side, the people who are staying up at night, it's on it's on them to have the automation, the test systems, the backups, right? This is the resilience of the system that is actually on back on the operations teams, back on these individual customers to have gone through processes to know how they're gonna they're gonna recover or re-image or reset those systems in as automated a way as they can get. And this is something that you know drills and rehearsals are really important for. In a lot of the cases that we're hearing, like the airports and, and terminals and things like that. Those systems are in closets. Those are there. There aren't on-site IT people, or there's minimal on-site IT people. I would expect some of those systems are going to require people to go up in ladders, right? If you're you're dealing with point-of-sale systems, there's no on-site IT in those retail establishments. So you're going to be on the phone talking somebody through processes. You're going to have to be working through it. Um, and the challenge is knowing who that person is showing them where the access is. There's, there's a litany of things that you would have to know to go through that case. And this is exactly what operations is about. It's an incredibly hard, complex job. Um, and you know we see operations failures all the time. Um, happily, a lot of them get swept under the rug uh, or are invisible because the operations teams t- is our, have already taken the steps to make things work. And as we were discussing earlier, that I'm not interested in playing the blame game here, but every other news item that you read is, hey, Windows failure. Yes, we would love to see more Linux. I mean, Linux dominates the world. We don't see Linux on desktop or clients any, that, that much, but people is blaming Microsoft and Windows. How much is Windows and Microsoft at fault here? None, I, none at all from that, from the perspective of, you know, if you were going to make an architectural change between Windows and Linux, uh, I wouldn't use this type of failure as a reason to pick one or over the other, right? Linux systems have their own update and their own challenges and distributions. They're actually harder to manage. They're less centralized. And so when you work with a Linux system, you are more on the ball or you're more responsible for making these types of patches and updates, which is excellent. Right, it, you know, one of the things that we do at RackN is we don't push patches to customers. They choose to pull the patches in and apply them. But the flip side of being responsible for that means that you have the responsibility to keep up with them, have your processes to do the work. And what we see in, in a lot of cases is customers who choose to be um, off the automated push systems, they are then responsible for staying up to date. And if they don't, then they are vulnerable for their own challenges, right? You know, as much as people in Linux want to say this this couldn't happen to us, which which is untrue, they have their own security. Every operating system, every platform has its own security challenges. There's another open SSH issue at the moment that is very severe, and people need to be taking actions to patch and mitigate and update for. And you know, we need to be careful about that. We just had a major security glitch. Um, around SSH in which that was caught really just by accident by a very careful Microsoft researcher. So, you know, these these aren't something we should blame people for. This is a component of running resilient IT systems. 
and we actually need to be supporting each other to make the systems easier to maintain, the automated systems safer to push, to build strong CI CD pipelines that can actually help automate and test these pieces. Um, that's actually a shared responsibility across the industry. And you know, anybody who thinks they're immune to this type of problem is, you know, really living on borrowed time because it's it it's going to happen um, as part of the systems. They're just too complex for us to not have. Um, these types of issues surface. Um, happily, a lot of times, and most of the time, they go completely without any, um, you know, any people noticing. Sometimes I, I think about this in Y2K because this, in some ways, was the disaster that people were expecting with Y2K. And Y2K took a, a huge industry-wide effort to mitigate and prevent those issues, test, make sure things weren't going to happen. Um, we had the, the benefit of foreknowledge there. Um, but this has been around for as long as we're building, not just computer systems, any type of interconnected infrastructure. I'm not going to talk about what cloud is trying to do or what Microsoft should do, but what airlines can do, what customers who got affected can do so they do not go through this again. Yeah, it's a very important point. This is, this is back to having very good operations hygiene. You know, when you look at building systems, it is very important to have multiple control paths for how you update, patch, and manage the systems. One of the things that we really caution people about is not just assuming that the operating system vendor is going to be your path for doing upgrades and patches. What you really have to think through is use their systems. They're great, but have a backup. Have an alternate way to deliver a patch or an update or control for a system. Um, we see customers think that they can they can cheat on the backup and resiliency systems. They're having two ways to get uh, common tasks done, and they think that oh, I'm not going to use it or I'm not going to use it very often, and therefore it's not important. Um, for example, reinstalling a Windows image, being able to reimage a system, reboot a system out of control. Most days, most years, possibly a, a customer might never need to use anything besides the built-in patching systems for Windows. This is exactly one of those lessons where that resiliency, that redundancy makes a huge difference, right? Your backup systems, while they're not used very often, doesn't make them less important. And I think that that's one of the biggest lessons that people should be taking from, from here is not don't patch or do that less. That's the exact opposite. What you have to be able to do is understand that you need backup and resiliency that is a different path to restore your systems and recover your systems. Ideally, you test that, you make that part of your normal cycle, but you, you can't just look at this as a, this vendor is gonna deliver all the controls that I need. You have to have alternate passes, processes, alternate paths. Uh, and the good news is that when customers that we see do that, when they have alternate paths and they have multiple ways to accomplish something, it reduces their vendor lock-in, which actually puts them in a much, much stronger position, not just on IT operations and resiliency, but supply chains, controls, choice about how they take and what they do with their IT infrastructure. So it really is a win-win component. It does take investment. And what about rack and customers? Were they affected? And if yes, is there anything you could have done or you did for them? That's an excellent question. I, I, I don't have specific uh, outage reports from our customers. The, the way we operate our systems, uh, we're, we're at a different level from when they would have taken this type of patch. Uh, what we I do know is that our customers using Windows deployments um, use image-based deployments, which means that if they needed to reset their systems, they wouldn't even have called us. They would have just initiated a re-image cycle, which is exactly the type of remediation that we would expect and recommend. So they would get control of the system. They would just reset that image. They wouldn't have to worry about logging in with safe mode or anything like that. They could just do a, a system reset, apply the image that they had that was working, and then move on, or a patched image, and then move on. Um, the, the thing that I would stress for our customers is because of those secondary control planes, that out-of-band management, the image-based deployments, it means that they're in a very good position to respond quickly, right? I'm 100% certain that our customers were impacted um, just because of the breadth of the operations. And... 
that the ones that were impacted in the places where they're using our software to deploy Windows, in this case, they would have had a very quick migration path and their outage impact window would have been much smaller than somebody, say, who had to find a server, run through a safe mode process and things like that. And that's the difference. Uh, you know, our expectation is that you are going to have impacts from events like this. It really is a question for the cut for the customer, the operations team is how resilient and quickly they can recover. And, and that to me is what the story, the, the, the story behind the story is about. It's not about Crowd, CrowdStrike introducing a patch that broke systems. That's, that's seri a serious uh, flaw. It's also about the operations teams that didn't have the resilience to quickly recover those systems and put them back online when they had the patch because the patch was very quickly available. It was the steps they had to go through to do that recovery that has taken a lot of time. Rob, once again, thank you so much for joining me and talk about uh, this you know, <laughs> big issue last week. Thanks for great insights and I look forward to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. I appreciate the time. 